We also get to hear from one of the, uh, the most quoted men in economics. Dr. Ray Perrin is here today, and, uh, and we're very fortunate to have him here given the, uh, the nature of our economy and the timing of certain things going on. It's, it's going to be a timely message. So we're excited to have Dr. Perrin in here as well. And for our invocation today, we have Randy McCauley, the CEO and President of Providence Bank of Texas. He's also an NLF board member, and he's on this banquet committee. So please welcome Randy McCauley. Well, I don't have an actual cool thing, but don't stand by a speaker when Randy Clinton is ordering you to the table. <laughs> If you will bow and pray with me. Oh, great and glorious Lord, we come to you today with open hearts in celebration of the blessings you have bestowed on us. We celebrate the heartfelt contributions of these people in our communities and towards those in need within them. While it seems we live in a chaotic time, pandemics, aggressions, hostilities, economic woes, we are thankful for our circumstance with you as our guide and great defender. Please give us, give us the comfort and resolve to remember our charge to help others. Give us strength as we live our daily lives. Remind us to be kind to others at, at all times and measure our days by the positive words and actions towards those around us. Give us selfless motivation to lift each other up through your glory and constant presence. While some days may be cloudy and dark, we know your incredible light will brighten them. Your love will illuminate the horizon and bring us eternal warmth. We pray for the people suffering in the world, in Ukraine, in America, and our own communities. Help us be an anchor in the storm for others with your constant companionship. Faith, hope, and love and the greatest of these is love. Please fill our hearts with love all the days of our lives. Let us offer each other peace throughout our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Randy. And for the pledges of allegiance, let's welcome uh, Westlake Mayor Laura Wheat. Hillwood, a broker company, 
Lion Barber, Providence Bank of Texas, Republic Services, and Texas Health Resources, HEB. So if we could give all of those sponsors a nice round of applause. Please notice the strong names on our, of, of our cable sponsors as well. Thank you to all of our sponsors because some of the proceeds today will help fund our scholarship program through the Northeast Leadership Forum Foundation, uh, which we'll discuss in greater detail later. If I could, I would like to ask the Northeast Leadership Forum Board of Directors to stand. Thank you for all your hard work year round to make this organization what it is. Also, wanted to thank our planning committee uh, for today's event. The chairman of that committee is Randy Clinton. Please stand. Uh, Rebecca Hessel, please stand. Randy McCauley, please stand. And last, but certainly not least, John Fletcher. They've done a lot of hard work and put together a lot of uh, good things for us to, to have today, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to, again, recognize Randy uh, Clinton for all of your efforts in securing the venue today and, and all of your hard work in sharing this committee. Also want to thank, <clears throat> I also want to thank those of you in the room, and you know who you are, who have helped start a new technical education scholarship program that, that runs concurrently with our, our, our normal scholarship program. It provides an education for students to focus on trade education, and last year we were able to raise right at $20,000 to distribute in the form of scholarships to uh, those students seeking trade education so we, we thank you for the normally we're at the, the point in the program where i would invite uh last year's chair uh up to, to say a few words and to also receive his chairman flag unfortunately uh our past chairman is not able to be with us today uh, Howard Shotwell uh, was unable to attend today, but he has agreed to produce a short video that will show on the screens here shortly. And for those of you that, that know Howard, he is salt of the earth. He is a, a great mentor to, to most everybody in our organization, and he is, is truly committed to, to the cause and, and actually spearheaded the initiative to give out trade scholarships uh, and, and, and really was the main person behind that effort. So we're going to take a few minutes and watch a video. Uh, Howard did want to say, share his gratitude. And so if you could play that video right now. Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased to see that you are all here today. This is the largest event I believe that we have for this particular award ever. And I am sincerely uh, apologetic that I cannot be there today. We had a great year last year. Our NLF added 25 new members. We had the largest attendance for an Arkansas, Texas meeting in November. We made the uh, application process a little bit easier and user friendly for new applicants. And most importantly, I was able to start a new initiative for scholarships last year, in addition to our standard scholarships. These scholarships are for skills training for those students that do not desire to go and get a four-year degree. I have been honored to be your chairman last year. It is a great organization, and I am honored to turn the chairmanship over to Shelby Broom this year. Thank you so much, and God bless.
may have heard Howard reference a few numbers, but he did. Uh, uh, we, we had our best membership effort in 2021 under his guidance. Uh, he established the Trade Scholarship Fund. Uh, Heart of North Texas was the most successful one we've had today. And so his impact has really put this organization in a place to where we can build on that momentum. And we're, we're all fortunate to be a part of that. So we appreciate Howard. We have a great number of elected officials here today. Uh, if you're an elected official, would you please stand so we can show our appreciation to your service in North Northeast Tarrant County, please? Thank you. 
uh, many of us know that obviously he found in the town and country drug stores, later sold to CBS. He developed a lot of real estate. He was a home builder. Uh, he helped found the Liberty Bank. He helped found the Bank of North Texas. So he's been a premier witness manager for many, for many years. He and his wife, Nancy, uh, were very philanthropic themselves. Uh, thanks to the foundation that was established at their death, the daughters, Jean Ann and Carolyn Ham DeGuire, Carolyn couldn't be here today, uh, on the foundation. They continue to give many, many dollars to educational endeavors, both at the collegiate level and also at the high school level. But this partnership with the North East leadership started about three years ago, and we will say with another $22,000 gift we're making to Max this year. The Hammond Foundation for four years and it was given $88,000 in matching scholarships. So again, <laughs> I'm going to be in this room and sit here and I can't help but uh, see Gary Hamilton sitting out here. Gary and I had the pleasure to work with Alan Hamilton when we were in Bank of North Texas. I won't say that was probably 100 years ago. The limited area in me probably was 100 years ago. But uh, anyway, I want to thank Jean Ann. I want to give her a moment to say on behalf of her parents that we hope to continue this partnership and hope to increase this partnership as we go forward. So again, to Jean Ann, to your family, we appreciate everything y'all have done. And you can say good work.
appreciate ECU's sponsoring four attendees from each of our school districts today. And at this time, please welcome Faye Blue, an NLF board member, a 2011 chairman of the board, a past president of the Texas Association of School Boards. We're a little ahead of schedule, and I'm going to go off script because I don't really know script very well. Uh, but it is Faye's birthday today. <laughs> so, not only do I want to give her a round of applause, let's sing happy birthday to her. Okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Dr. Joe Harrington. 
Matt Romero is the board president. Andrea Marks Garcia, and we know it's Andy, the 2021 elementary teacher of the year. From Keller ISC, Dr. Rick Westfall, superintendent. Ruthie Keys, board president. Mandy Schneider, 2021 elementary teacher of the year. And Sandra McCorkle, 2021 secondary teacher of the year. From Northwest ISC, Dr. Ryder Warren, superintendent. Dr. Ann Dennis Simpson, board president. Aaron Cox, 2021 elementary teacher of the year. And Jeff Oster, 2021 secondary teacher of the year. Our final district from Westlake Academy. Amanda McGann, superintendent. Dr. Michelle Bryson, outgoing executive director. Sean Wilson, incoming executive director. Laura Fisher, primary teacher of the year. And Katie Estrada, secondary teacher of the year. At this point, we will recognize all of these districts. Thank you. Thank you, Faye, and happy birthday. Now we are going to present the highest honor of the year, the Distinguished Leadership Award. As we prepare to honor our 2021 Distinguished Leadership Award recipient, I ask that all previous winners of this prestigious award please stand and be recognized. You can see from the list that's on your table, it's quite the who's do. So we're grateful to have those in attendance. And now one of the highlights of the luncheon, I'd like to ask the Honorable Oscar Trevino, Mayor of North Richland Hills, past chairman of NLF, and the 2008 recipient of the Distinguished Leadership Award, um, and, and last year's recipient, John Fletcher, to join me on the stage. Good afternoon. What an honor for me to be here today to introduce this year's Distinguished Leadership Award. I've asked the 2018 recipient of this award, Tom Lombard, who is a dear friend of the recipient, to join me in the presentation. This award was created in 1991 to honor a person who has given many years of service to the Northeast Tennessee area. Leon Reed may be an elected official, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, a civic organization, an educational organization, a nonprofit organization, or just a general contributor to quality of life and well being of the citizens of the Northeast Tarrant County area. This year's award winner is someone whose service spans all of those areas. If there's a cause to be championed, you'll, you're likely to find him on the front lines. He does not sit back and wait for someone else to make things happen. He believes in giving back to his community, and he gives back generously with his time as both an elected official and 
a community volunteer. I very often give Tio a hard time and tell him that he just can't say no. But he just won't say no. But truthfully, it's that he cares greatly for his community and for the people that live and work in it. He gives his time to so many organizations because he believes in them and he believes in the people that they serve. He is a servant leader. And if there's ever a need, he's the first one to step up and volunteer. For these and many other reasons, we are honored to present this year's Distinguished Leadership Award to our friend and associate, Tito Rodriguez. Tito. I've been waiting for this for a long time. 
There's absolutely no pressure on today's speaker. Uh, sure, you might not have won Super Bowls or had a Hail Mary on last year's speaker, Drew Pearson. However, he meets with congressmen, senators, presidents, and CEOs who have a lot to say with their own Hail Marys while waiting for his insights. Our speaker this afternoon is more than a brilliant economist. He actually is one of the most brilliant people alive on this planet because he just told me so. <laughs> Ray Perry has made a name for himself back in the early 80s, but he was the only person to predict that the glut of oil would happen and there would be a crash of oil prices, and he was absolutely right. He was the person that Ross Perot Jr. told to meet about a massive vacant field and strategized about an inland port in a couple of developments called Hillwood and Alliance, Texas. Texas Monthly calls him the most quoted man in Texas. Business Week calls him a world-class scholar. And that newspaper on the other side of Highway 360 calls him the state's preeminent economist and a barbecue connoisseur. Please welcome the economist who will tell it like it is, and he also is a published author. He will be auctioning off some of his books called Survive and Conquer Texas in the 80s, Money, Power, Tragedy, and Hope. We're going to have a lot of fun. Be prepared to learn. Be prepared to smile. Please welcome my friend, Ray Perry. Thank you, John. Is this how I'm working on Ray? I'm good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I would like to check. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's great. I appreciate John's kind words. You never know exactly what you're getting. I'm pretty good use of you. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, congratulations on this award. When I, when I heard about the award, you know, I, I looked at the list, and obviously Mary Trevino is good. I, I looked at it, and uh, Vicki Truitt is a dear friend of mine, and she's won it, and uh, uh, Glenn Green is a dear friend of mine, and she's won it. So I, I thought, this is really something special. These are really good people. Then I saw John Fletcher won it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I love John. Don't get me wrong, he's like a grandfather to me. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but I never thought of him in quite that way. And so I decided to ask some folks around the chambers and people I talked to them. I said, no, what do you think, John? You know, what, what do you think? I, I, I was kind of taken back. You know, I, I was surprised. And they said, uh, two different people said to me, he said, brother, he's like a god. I said, what? He said, yeah, he's like a god. And I said, well, I'm looking to explain to me how he's like a god. And they said, well, we've never seen him. Anytime he does anything, it's a miracle. <laughs> No, it's, it, it, it is great to be here with you. It's great that you can be in person, you know. And it's, <laughs> you can do it, man. I like that. And it's true. Seriously, John, John, John's daughter and my daughter are the best friends in television. So we go back to ways. And we go back to all when we first met through our daughter's friendship. But, uh, uh, and I'm not going to say what that day that was. <laughs> so, but, but anyway, it's, it, it's great to be with you. It's great to be here. It's so nice that we can all get together like this again. And then we can all get safe. It's just been a rough couple of years in a lot of ways. And I tell you, this is a great full room. I love that you're well worth putting on a pair of pants for. Which is something I haven't had to do for all my speeches for the last couple of years. But uh, anyway, it's great to be here. I mean, we all know one escape the pain. In some way, get your business, get your family, get your friends. It was, it, it was so broad based. Everybody had something. My family had a few, uh, nothing major. But I guess the biggest issue we had was I'm on the road on the average about 300 uh, days a year. And during the pandemic, I was home about 300 days. Uh, that's just quite an adjustment. Yes. My wife had always said the secret to our marriage was we could be married 30 years and dead in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I was all of a sudden home, and, and, and so one day I was on her absolute last number. I mean, totally on her last number. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, honey, you know, the problem is I'm kind of like bad taste in medicine. You know, I, I'm sort of better in smaller doses. And, and she looked at me and she said, you are absolutely nothing like bad taste in medicine because eventually it makes you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one more quick story about her. I can't go. But, uh, I, John mentioned I've been blessed with a bunch of awards and stuff. People said some very nice and kind things about me over the years. And some not so kind of things. That's what happened to me. Jump into every box and find. But, uh, but anyway, I, a, couple, a couple years back, I got an award that really meant something to me. It really did. And, and the, I grew up in a small town in rural East Texas. About 1,000 people when I was there. It's about 5,000 now. I got pretty successful after I left. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, they, were, they started a distinguished alumni at the local school district. And they were kind of empty. And that really meant a lot to me, because that was people that were with me who grew up. 
they know what a nerd you were and that sort of thing. And it was still kind of enough to do that. I don't know, it's been a couple of days and saw a lot of old friends and had a nice time. And, and my wife asked me what it was like growing up in a town that small. And I said, it's great, I love it. It's wonderful. Nobody locked the door. She'd ride your bike everywhere. It was great. She said, well, what were the challenges? I said, I don't think we had any. It was pretty good. She said, oh, come on, we had some problems in the, in the town that small. I said, well, the only thing that bothered me a little bit was we were so small we had to take driver's education and sex education in the same car. <laughs> She thought about that for a minute, and she said, Ray, you know that makes perfect sense. You can't drive either. <laughs> okay, I'll stop that. <laughs> uh, what, I thought, what, what I thought I would do uh, is, or, or if you like this, I can kind of be good. <laughs> I really like this for that one. But, uh, but, but anyway, we do have, I have a lot to say because of I think there's a lot going on. I mean, I've had an outage the last couple of years. Anything happened? I don't know. You know, there is a lot going on. I want to try to give you some perspective on some of that stuff and, and try to make some sense out of some of it for you. And hopefully, I'll have some time to think for questions. But the last few come up because I'm going to be round up here. And uh, don't try to take notes because my kids say I talk at, at 400 words a minute with Gus at 700. So that's me. But anyway, uh, I thought the first thing we do, nobody was well in the pandemic. And I thought I'd point out just a couple of things about it that made it so different and, and, and kind of difficult to adjust to and that sort of thing from an economic perspective, obviously from a health and safety perspective and all sorts of other issues. But the first thing is, normally when we have a recession in this country, it's not because of something like this. And strangely enough, it's not the old-fashioned business cycle that we have taught you about if you ever had any of your economics class. And the economy's never been a sign curve. It's never had to smooth ups and down, ever. But we did have cycles for a long time because most economies start out as agricultural economies. And when you have an agricultural economy, you're going to have cycles based on the weather. And so, and, you know, so, so they, you know, the economy did kind of have cycles. But as we got more sophisticated, more things going on, you know, one thing can be going down, another thing can be going up. And if you're diverse enough, you can just keep right on growing. If you think about our last few economic expansions in, in this country, it's all been eight, nine, ten years. And the last was 11 years, right before the pandemic hit. It's all been really long. And uh, in fact, the, the last four have been four of the five longest in the history of the country. Interesting enough, one the other one got into the Washington administration. So that goes back to that. But, uh, but, but anyway, and now it wasn't all that great back then anyway, so we're not that sure. But, but, but anyway, um, the, uh, so, but, but normally we have, you know, like I say, and we see that in Texas all the time, because for example, right now, the price of oil's up. How many have noticed that? Well, if you live in the middle, or Odessa, or Houston, that may well be a good thing, okay? But if you live somewhere else, it's probably not a good thing. Yeah. And so one thing can go up, other things can go, go down, and we can kind of keep growing through all that stuff. We can manage to do that pretty well. And when we have a recession, it's always because we did something stupid. Yeah. That, that, it, it's never that we've had, a, I don't remember, and I've studied centuries of this stuff, I've never seen an economic expansion that died of old age. I've never seen one. It, it's something like, you know, we went crazy about mortgages a few years ago. You, you know, gave everybody to find a mortgage whether they needed one or not, and that created a problem. A few years from that, we got all hopped up on dot-com stocks. We decided that every, every stock whose last name was dot-com was worth a billion dollars. And a few years before that, we decided to syndicate a whole bunch of buildings and buildings and slaves and loans without paying any attention to whether anybody go in or not. You know, I mean, it's like we create a bubble, the bubble burst, and then, you know, we, we kind of fix that and go, and go forward. This one was a big force from the outside. It was, that's one thing that's very different. The other thing was how fast and how hard it is. And I think that's the thing that really caught everybody off guard. Um, I can cite a million statistics I'll say in the whole side of the couple. <laughs> One is, uh, if you go back to the Great Recession in 2008, which was the worst thing we've seen since the Great Depression, the mortgage bubble, we lost in this country 9.4 million jobs in 14 months. We lost 6,700,000 jobs every month. I mean, it, was, it was pretty brutal. But 9.4 million jobs in 14 months, and that's the worst we've ever seen. This was 22 million jobs in two months. Two and a half times as many jobs in one second of time. And we've just never seen anything like this. It didn't drop like a rock. And one of the interesting things was there's a statistic that people like me look at all the time, but before this thing happened, nobody ever looked at it. A few people look at it now. It's called initial claims for unemployment, which is a very long-winded way of saying layoffs. 
because the reason you file an initial claim for unemployment is you just lost your job. So it's basically layoffs. And um, and that number, we really we pay attention to it, it comes out every week. And so it's a pretty decent snapshot of what's going on. And, and, and the highest that number had ever been was back in the 80s when we got to 695,000. In the Great Recession, we got to 660,000. Almost 700,000 people laid off in one week. But it had never broken 700,000. That was the highest it ever got. In April 2020, it got to 6.9 million in one week. Okay? Ten times the highest that we've ever seen. But what's even more interesting is when you want to get your arm around this thing, for the next 54 weeks, it never went below 700,000. We had never been above 700,000 before this thing started. And we didn't, and we stayed above it for 54 straight weeks. Okay. So, I mean, and all that to say, it was really deep and long. The U.S. economy lost, I say, 22 million jobs. That's about 14% of our total economy. As of this morning, with the new numbers that came out, we've gotten most of them back. We're down about uh, 1.7 million from where we were, which is about 1.4% or so. So we're about 1.1% actually. So we're actually making a little bit of headway there, almost back to even. Texas got all its jobs back in 19 months, which is pretty good. In November, we got all our jobs back. We're up about 200,000 jobs. We don't have 1.4 million, but we're, we're up about 200,000 jobs before we were before this thing started now. Which is lower, almost 2%. This area, Metroplex, did even better. Did you expect? We got all yours back in 15 months. July, you had already made up all, all the losses in 15 months. That's really, really remarkable. You're up now about uh, almost 4%, about, uh, oh, about 150,000 jobs. And I don't want to throw a lot of numbers at you, but these two sink in. I just mentioned Texas is net up about 200,000 jobs. The Metroplex is net up about 150,000 jobs. Okay? That kind of tells you how well you're doing. Austin's up about 60. So if you had the Metroplex and Austin together, you got everybody else is broke even, some up, some down. Everybody else is kind of broke even. And the Metroplex and Austin uh, sort of growth has driven the net growth that we've had thus far. We've all seen a lot of that happen. Our forecast for the area is that that's going to continue. We see a lot of movement in this area. We're projecting growth about 3.8% a year for the next five years or so on average. A little bit front loaded. But, but, um, but nonetheless, it's a very healthy economy. You see that all the time. New locations, new expansions, new activity taking place. Uh, almost every day there's some kind of new indicator, some kind of new announcement or something that talks about how well you're doing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to shift gears and talk about some things that normally I wouldn't spend much time on. Usually when I talk to an audience in Texas, I don't spend too much time talking about the national economy and the world economy. But there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> And so I thought I'd kind of plunge right in and talk about supply chains, and inflation, and the workforce, and, and uh, uh, you know the, the, the Ukraine, and the, the uh, uh, everything's going on with, with oil prices and that sort of thing. Just kind of the border immigration, oh man, you just kind of covered off. I promise I'll make everybody mad at some point. <laughs> I take pride in the fact that I have an equal opportunity to offend. I, I truly, I, I like to offend both parties every chance I get. Talked to a lot of my friends in the football team. I've succeeded pretty well at that. <laughs> but, uh, no, but, but anyway, I, I'm going to try to give you perspective that's maybe a little different than what you see on the evening news because it's hard to get this stuff right sometimes. No offense. <laughs> you do a good job. We know, you, we know each other for years. You do a good job. Yeah. But, uh, and, and Bob, you do a good job too. <laughs> uh, anyway, let me, uh, so let me just kind of put down, it, it really doesn't matter where you start, they're all kind of interconnected. I'll start with supply chain because we're, we're hearing a lot about that right now. Think about the world economy for just a minute. Kind of visualize it in your mind as a hundred million, I'm sorry, a hundred trillion dollar engine. So that's about how much we produce every year. Hundred trillion dollar engine. Biggest engine you can possibly imagine. And it's been purring along for about a decade. It's, it's doing good. It didn't all change every now and then. It's kind of chugging along, doing okay. You know. And then one day you stop it. And I don't mean you tap on the brakes and ease it down. I mean, you shut off the key, jump out, let it run into a tree. And then you take a bunch of sledgehammers, and you go in there and just bang on it for a while. Just bang it up good. Okay. And then you leave it out in the elements for about six or eight months. And then you try to start it. And it kind of chugs a little bit, it kind of gets going a little bit, and then you do the same thing all over. And then you come along a few, uh, you know, a year, year and a half later, so okay, let's start it up now. What do you think is going to happen? It's not going to be a smooth start. You know, we can't, you can't shut down to the degree we shut down as many things as we shut down. 
and then and, and come back very, very quickly. And so it, you know, it, it's taken a while to get the to get the goods back into the ports, to get the ports geared up to operate, to get the truckers geared up to deliver the stuff that comes to the ports, to get the stuff made that goes into other things that need to be made. Uh, and, and, and we had some, some special factors come out in that thing along the way too. The kinds of things that are always happening in the economy, but we can roll with them usually, but when you layer on top of the pandemic, they get really bad. For example, this big chip shortage we had. Okay, can't get chips anywhere. There's three big factors that make those chips in the world. The one in South Korea had a huge fire, right in the middle of this. Like I said, we could have rolled with that, take away everything else that's going on, but on top of everything was hard. You may have heard we had a cold snap in Texas last year. You may have heard no, okay, we had a post now. When you shut down the, the ports on the Texas Gulf Coast for a week or 10 days, you create major problems in delivering things in the economy. Because people don't realize this, but one out of every six dollars of exports from this country from the state of Texas. Yeah. And a lot of them, you know, a lot of them go through these airports, it's not far from here, but, but, but most of them, ultimately about 90% of them start out in the water. And so when that, when that can't happen, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of things start to a lot of dominoes start to fall. So we've had a lot of those kind of problems. The nice thing about markets is, uh, if you ever get really, really bored, you find it once like a lecture on markets, and I mean it will put you to sleep in no time. But but one of the nice things, that, and the good and the bad, there's both. It's a, they're wonderful. They're a lot of great things. But one of the best things they do is, anytime you create a problem, immediately you create the incentive to solve the problem. That's what markets do. All of a sudden, there's profit. If you can be the one that can get the deliveries working, if you can be the one to make things happen, you can make more money. And so we, as soon as you have a problem, you start the process of solving. And, and, that's, and that's basically what's been happening. We would be probably 80% of the way through it right now had it not been for the recent thing in Ukraine. That's back to something again, because it creates uncertainty, it interrupts oil supplies, it, it messes up the agricultural universe. Uh, Ukraine and Russia combined to provide 25% of all the grain in the world. Now, and that's, that, that's not only the bread we eat, it's the feed for the animals too. So I mean, there's a whole thing that goes through a lot of different channels. All of that gets bogged up and slowed down as well. And so they're just, you know, these, these things are dancing. I think it's gonna take us close to the end of the year now to, to be out of this, but the process is ongoing. And then I, I guess with that, I'll shift it for just a minute here into inflation. We all heard about that, we all talk about that right now, that sort of thing. Um, inflation, there's a, a lot of different pieces to it. I'm gonna try to break it out a little bit here. But you've probably heard the definition at some point in your life. The, the simple shorthand definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. That's how we really define inflation in the man on the street definition. It's actually pretty good. Well, the too few goods that spot chain had just talked about. We can't get the stuff out. So that's one half of it. Either, either half can cause problems. We got both of them going at once. The too much money happened this way. As you all know, during the pandemic, the federal government made the decision to spend a lot of money. And I don't fault that decision at all. In fact, I was kind of in the middle of some of it. Because we had, you know, we had people who were going to starve on the rise. We had very well run local small businesses, probably some of you in this room, who went months without revenue. And you know, they need a hand, a hand up, okay? And, and, and we had to do some of these things. It comes with a price, in terms of that. But basically, the government was faced with a bad choice, and it actually had a strong choice. There was no good choice. And so they chose the bad one, which is good. Okay? Sometimes that's the best you can do. And, and they did it, but they didn't do it perfectly, obviously, because they can't. I mean, they didn't go door to door, knock on door, and say, okay, let's evaluate what your situation, see how much money you get. You know, they, how much money do you need? They, didn't, they can't do that. They write formulas. So the end result was a bunch of people got money that they really didn't need. And you know, I see some hidden money. Like, you know, extra cash in pocket, okay. Well, now, put yourself in this situation. Some of you probably aren't born in this situation. You've been cooped up for a year. You don't want to get out so bad you can't stand it. And you've got a little extra money in your pocket. And all of a sudden, they ring the and say, okay, you can go out now. What are you going to do? We're going to spend that money. And that's what we did. So that's too much money. Okay, so we have both things going on at once. And that's driving a lot of this. And then some special factors between the war is uh, is ratcheting up oil prices even more, and that's uh, and that's that's an impact. We're now going through the strategic petroleum reserve release, which will help a little bit. It's not going to solve the problem. I mean, the release we're talking about is a really big one, but it's five percent of U.S. demand every day and one percent of world demand every day. So it's it's not like we're all of a sudden going to have two dollar gas again. You know, 
that, that's not what's coming our way. But I think it, but it can help a little bit, and you can kind of help, help you through some of this. I probably don't have time to say everything I want to say about energy today, but, but uh, we've got to do some long-term stuff to fix energy. And at the same time, we do with climate issues. Not like, you know, as I say, if I have time, I'll talk about that a little bit. But, the, but that's all what I would call the short-term inflation. There's only one other thing I want to say about that. You're seeing a lot of headlines right now. I know you've all seen this is the worst inflation since the 70s and 80s. This is, man, this is bad. And statistically, it is. Percentage growth is the worst. But this is not the late 1970s and early 1980s. The end of the Carter administration, the end of the Reagan administration. This is not that time. This is not that time. This is not that time. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll just give you a couple of simple examples. But I have kind of a little bit of firsthand knowledge of that quite by accident. Back when I was a little bitty, bitty baby economist, and I was working on my dissertation out of Rice, I built the, the first really big model of the U.S. monetary system, actually the global monetary system, and, and all that. And uh, at that point in time, there weren't any others. And, uh, and so when, when Paul Volcker became chairman of the Federal Reserve in that time period, and they decided to wrench inflation out of the economy, I had the only man in town, but I was in my 20s, they pulled me up there to help. So I got kind of baptism by fire and that whole thing. But I got to see it from the inside, which was also good. And those of you, many of you in this room were not old enough to remember this, but I certainly am. In the late 70s, early 80s, if you went into the bank to open a savings account, just a plain old savings account, not a CD or anything, if you just went to the bank, I'd see your head, now you remember that, yeah. Plain old, plain old savings account. You got 5% interest. If you went to the savings loan, you got 5 and 4 because they went to that, the house was stacked on the land. But yeah, it's just a head shaking, y'all remember that. If you think about that, what if you go to the bank today to, 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 to buy a CD? Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's pretty, it rounds off to zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, but the, but the point being, when you when everybody got 5% to walk in the door with no risk or anything else, you set a floor on inflation. We had structurally built in inflation back then. In the entire church, we had to read all that out. You even had, it was not uncommon to have contracts with construction folks out here with 30 day escalation clauses in them. And they raised the construction costs every 30 days. I see some heads talking about that one too. I mean, I mean, it was a different world. All of that's gone. We don't have that today. So, this is not a long term, we're stuck with this forever kind of thing. But we do have to work through the, the issues we have now. And we'll get the supply chain fixed, get the dollar, all that extra money, you know, that, that'll happen. But we will be left with a little bit higher long term inflation than we've had in the past. Not a whole lot, but of course, then one and a half to two percent will probably be two and a half percent, something like that. A little bit more. And that's because that's the price we pay for all that money that the federal government had to put out there. Now the Federal Reserve's raising interest rates, and they're starting to, to uh, 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 bring the balance sheet down to a more reasonable thing, not putting quite so much money out of the and that sort of thing. They're going to watch that as this uh, Ukrainian situation plays out, and other things, but, and they will. But, but they're, they're starting to do that, so you know, it's going to build in a little more inflation. As I say, it was, there was not a good choice. And that's the price we'll pay for, for picking a bad choice over the catastrophic choice. And so we're going to have some inflation with us for a while. Talk about the workforce and this whole thing, too. If you believe what you read, oh, let me mention one more thing about the inflation and supply chain and all that stuff, just because the media gets it wrong. Not you guys, but the big guys. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've probably seen the headlines, and probably, hopefully you didn't pay too much attention to it, but there's been headlines lately where they said trade deficit was the highest in history last month. We're, I mean, we're just getting killed. The trade deficit's terrible. That's a good thing. The reason the trade deficit is so high right now is we're unloading boats. You can't, as long as it's touching the water, it doesn't count as an import. So we're in, if you unload four or five months worth of boats in one month, you're going to get a big number. And that's what we've been able to do is this importance of not on double ships and getting more of this stuff out there is if we're counting the imports that have been sitting in the water. Okay, so, so don't get freaked out by that. <laughs> Workforce. Again, if you, if you read some of that stuff, you think nobody's ever going to work again. You know, we've seen the end of work and we know it. And things have changed. And this was a life-changing event. A lot of people reassessed their, their, their world. But, but the thing is, like, that the workforce shortages is a major, major issue we're going to have to deal with. But it was a major issue before the pandemic ever started. It's going to be a major issue after the pandemic. And it has to do with demographics. And then it, then it, a little bit through the pandemic. I'll, I'll show you again about 20%. But it's mostly just the fact that the baby boomers are getting older and retiring. The young people aren't coming in as fast as the workforce. 
And, and, and we just don't have enough folks. And that's basically what it comes down to. So they will not fit in that. You hear the statistics right now, we have 10 million job openings in the country. But the, what they forget to tell you is we had 8 million before the pandemic ever started. We have 2 million more. And here's why. The number of people who are participating in the workforce of the working age population before the pandemic was 63.4%. It, it was about 50% forever, uh, for years and years and years and decades and decades, because almost every guy working almost every day did it. And then starting in the 60s and 70s, all females in the workforce got way up in the 70s. Okay. And then since that time, everybody's been working that quite as much, so it's been going down. But it was 63.4% before the pandemic. It's 61.7% today. So 1.7% of the people have decided, yeah, we're not doing this, at least for now. That's coming up a little bit, even now. But, you know, 1.7%. That's not everybody getting the workforce forever. But 1.7% of 150 million people, which is how many people in the workforce, if there you got your 2 million, that, that gets you from 8 to 10. That, that's where it comes from. And, and so once the pandemic's behind us, to whatever extent it, it, it can only get us put behind us, whatever happens, these other problems resolve themselves, we're still going to have a workforce. And that brings me to a topic John asked me to talk about. I try to leave it out. I would be in trouble with this one. And, and, and that's immigration on the border. That's what's going on the border. And let me, let me kind of break that down for you a bit. There's, there's three different pieces I'm going to focus on in terms of immigration. One of them is the, the thing that gets the most public, that's all the folks from Central America who are coming up here right now. Okay. And that really doesn't have much to do with our workforce at all. I think. The only solution to this one, I've, I've talked to the folks in, in both parties in Washington about this, but realistically, I think the only solution is we have to help those countries. They are riddled with gangs and violence, and they've had a huge drought of what used to be a lush agricultural region. Okay. Now think about it. If you, are, if you were a mama or a daddy, and your kid was starving, and your kid was subject to being killed any time, <coughs> you'd probably try to get out of it. That's what you're doing. If you got problems sent back, you probably try to come out of there again. I mean, so it's going to take solving those problems to solve that problem. I mean, if we can't pass enough laws to say don't come in to, to fix that, you know, we, I mean, we can, we can try to do it. The bottom line is, if, if you can see opportunities for safety and opportunity in one place and death and starvation in another, and you have some kids, you're, you're not going to stay down there. And so that, but that's you're really not much to do the workforce. There's two pieces I want to go back that have a lot to do with our workforce. One is what I would call, for lack of a better, traditional undocumented workers, the folks who come over here uh, on a regular basis, primarily for, for, for Mexico. Uh, they're about 10% of our workforce. Most people don't realize that about one out of 10 people who are working in the state of Texas today are undocumented. They're 40% of our construction workforce. They're over 40% of our agricultural workforce. They're about 30% our hospitality workforce. So if you want to grow anything, build anything, or go anywhere, we, we kind of need some of those folks. Now what that says is it doesn't say that do what we're doing now. It says passing immigration reform that you use workers when you need them. And this is not rocket science. We're short of workers. They have them over there. They want to come. It shouldn't take a genius to figure out some way to, to make that happen. It's not the illegal putting risk on employers, putting safety risk on people and that sort of thing. To make it, you know, just basically what's happening now is it's part of the labor market. We're just forcing it to be inefficient. And through sensible laws, we can make it more efficient. The other piece of it, which nobody wants to talk about, is because everybody thinks about that when we think about immigration, it's one of those two things. Now, let me lay something else on that. 25% of the doctors practicing in this country today are immigrants, 22% of the scientists and engineers are immigrants. I don't mean they're daddy they're immigrants, I mean they're immigrants. 22% of our other healthcare workers. Bottom line is, we need those people. When, you, when you're not making people and you need people, and there's people over there, again, I don't think it's rocket science. <laughs> but, but our policies, right now, five or six years ago, we were, we were admitting a million people a year. Now we get 250,000. And we have workforce shortage. We're 10 million workers short, and we're not letting folks in. So again, what that says is do it right. Do sensible policies that, that preserve safety, preserve integrity of our, of our country and everything else, but figure out a way to use those workers. Because and that's what the market's done, is figure out a way to use those workers. It just has been forced to do it in an efficient way. So that's kind of a, a take on that. I won't say we'll go back to the graphics at the end if I, if I have a little bit of time. 
Uh, but but uh, but I also want to say just a little bit about energy before I jump forward into something else. Okay, because energy is very interesting right now. Our firm has just done a study. We haven't even released it yet. But our firm has done a study where we really really did a major dive on the climate, the environment, and everything else. Because we do have a climate crisis. A lot of people don't want to admit it, but we do. There's no there's no two ways about it. We have a climate crisis, and we have to deal with it. But we also have to have energy resources for the future. And we, we literally took the government's own numbers. We took the Department of Energy's numbers, the same folks who say we don't want any pipelines, we don't want any building, we don't want any, any major support ship or anything. Those very, but we took their numbers. And we looked at them and, and you know, unvarnished their numbers. Those numbers alone show we need 30% more oil and natural gas in the future than we need today. Even with a huge growth, with 400% growth in renewables. If you really get aggressive, you have 600% growth in renewables. You still need a little bit more than you have now. So we're going to have to have those resources. We're also going to have to burn them cleaner. Yeah. One party doesn't like it when I say we're going to have to have that stuff because they want to get rid of it. The other party gets mad when I say, but, but we can't do it the way we're doing it now. So I, I hope I've offended anybody there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's true that there's, there's a place for the carbon content to There's ways to capture carbon that we can incentivize. There, there's all kinds of things we can do. And people talk about electric vehicles. They're wonderful. They're great. They're very good. But they don't stop emissions. They transfer the emissions from the road to the power plant. But that's a good thing because it's harder to stop it going up and down the road than it is in one fixed point. So that's a good thing. You can capture it better at one fixed point. But a huge percentage of the, even with renewable growth at four or five hundred percent in the next in the next thirty years, a big chunk of new new electric electricity is going to be generated with natural gas. And so you know, but so again, they they, they just shift them around. So all that to say, we have energy policy really messed up right now, and we have climate policy really messed up right now, and we, and we need to fix that in the long term. That takes me back to the circle. I said I want to say a little bit more about the strategic reserve. I think right now that's a good thing. We did some out there to try to help, to help the situation, lower folks, the gasoline prices will be and some other costs and that sort of thing. People don't realize that we talk about gasoline, that's about 40, a little over 40% of what petroleum is used for. It's diesel that hauls everything around. It's jet fuel. That holds our jets. But let's get out of transportation for a minute. There's still about 30% of it left. It's plastics, synthetic fibers, fertilizers, paint, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals. I mean, it is everywhere in this economy. So when the price of oil goes up, it's not just the one that's in our face every day. That's what we think about because we can't, can't avoid it. But it's, it has so many roles to play in, in our economy. And when you, you know, when, when you do these kind of things you're doing now, but you say, we don't want you investing in this in the future. The companies can't raise capital to do what they need to do today. And so we, we just got it messed up. You know, we need to have policies that say we want to move as quickly as we can and as fast as we can to safe, reliable, renewable energy. We need to get as much of that stuff as we can get. If we get all that we can possibly get, we're still going to need some of this other stuff. So let's try to figure that out a way to do that better too. And uh, I've had, I'm forcing them on the the House Energy Advisory Committee and the Consulting Department here, so I have to sit and act like they're listening to me. Pretty often. <laughs> I'm not sure they really are. But they, they nod. They do nod. <laughs> but then they go out and do the same thing they always do. <laughs> but, but anyway, but I want to give you the other side of that equation right quick. There is a solution, another solution, if we want to get rid of oil and gas, we can. That solution is we don't let the global economy grow. Because you can't grow that energy. That's the only other solution we don't grow. There are 700 million people in this world. Twice the population of the United States who live on a dollar ninety a day or less. And there's some poverty we can't even imagine out there. And if we want the world to overcome that, to be a better place, most of the economic growth is right now is coming in those regions. If we want to support that, we have to support their development. And, and, and with that comes energy and cleaner energy. And we got a chance to start from scratch there and do it right. So there's a whole lot going on there with all that. Okay. Final thing I want to talk about, and hopefully I've got a little time. Yeah, I'm going to have a few initial questions. Uh, let me, uh, one final thing I want to mention. I focus on a lot of different issues here right now, and, and we have some kinds of questions. I'm happy to go in a different direction, too. But um, uh, the final thing I want to say is we really think about this short term stuff all the time. Because, you know, we have to get a good with it every day. That's understandable. <clears throat> but in the grand scheme of things, most of the stuff we, we hear about every day is not going to determine where we are in 20 or 30 years. It's really not. I mean, 
you know, you'll see the stock market fall or rise 300 points, 500 points based on whether Microsoft or Amazon was a penny above or a penny below what the analysts guess they would earn. Does that really affect the, the total value of all the uh, corporate, major corporate assets in the United States for the next 20, discount to the present for all time because one company missed something by a penny? Or that we thought the CPI would come in at 5.6%, it came in at 5.8% for one month? No. But, you know, we tend to overreact and work on that. You have the long term three things drive economies. What am I already talking about a little bit? One of them is technology. You're obviously in, in an area right here that's really benefiting from the growth of that right now. And the pandemic, if anything, creates more needs. When you create needs, you create technology to solve needs. We would not have gotten these vaccines as quickly as need had to rose. I saw the other day, you may have seen the airport where you press, press the button on the elevator and automatically sanitizes. We wouldn't have that technology out in the market today if this thing hadn't happened. Much like we wouldn't have all the retinal scanners and that sort of stuff, and that wouldn't have happened. It would have eventually happened, but we accelerated the technology because it creates a need. That's what that, 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 that's what we did, and so I think if anything that was probably going to it's, you know, not going to change dramatically, but that, but it is going to accelerate just a little bit. The second thing is the trade cost patterns. That is, what how many, you know, where are the cheapest to make something? And you know the answer to that question is but quite often China, Malaysia, South Korea, someplace like that, and that's fine. You know they they do things better, faster, cheaper. We're all better off. We buy stuff from them. We use it in our stuff, but. Companies have kind of figured out now that sometimes you can't get that stuff. And that's caused a major redevelopment to begin to take place here in North America. And I think this area benefit from it a lot. Good example, I mentioned chips earlier. There hadn't been a chip plant in this country in 15 to 20 years, okay? In the last three months, we have seen TI announce a $30 billion plant just north of here in Sherman. We've seen Samsung announce a $17 billion plant in the south of us down in Taylor. By the way, they have some really good, Louis Mellon's some really good partners in that future. That guy got a damn beer award for his wrist. And they just, Intel just announced a $20 billion in Ohio. I don't know how they screwed up with Ohio. But, 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 but the point is, $70 billion of in new investment in the last three months in something we hadn't invested in. in, in 15 years because you realize it's, we may have a little bit more over here because our labor costs are higher, whatever, but it's better to have a safe supply and be sustainable. That part of profitability is sustainability. That message is coming through. So I think that actually helps uh, the country a lot. And obviously, we compete very well here in Texas for those things. So I think that's one. The third one is demographics. And it's a boring subject. And I have a good friend who used to run the Census Bureau, a very good demographer, retired now. And uh, I, told him, I told him one time, I said, you know, the, the thing about demography is you guys are guys that are good with numbers but don't have the personality to be an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it is the size, it's literally the size of how many people are born, how many people die, and where they move in between. And that's what the graph is. That's what it is. It's not exactly, it's, it's not exactly blasting out rockets or something. But, uh, but anyway, the, uh, but it drives our world in ways we can't even imagine. And I mentioned that workforce shortage. That is 100% because of demographics. And that's why we have it. I want to give you just a, a few numbers here about Texas because you're obviously a very influential group of uh, folks and, and folks in leadership and that sort of thing. And we need to get some messages out there. I think you guys are some of you can help us. So I'm going to go on soapbox for a minute. And I warn you, I'm almost five foot seven when I get on my soapbox. <laughs> But anyway, let's talk about demographics from the census came out not long ago. There were one million fewer people in this country under the age of 18 than there were 10 years ago. And so we already have a workforce shortage. There's one million fewer people under the age of 18 than there were 10 years ago. Okay? There are 440,000 more people under the age of 18 in the state of Texas. So literally, the country would be down 1.44 million to one for us. I mean, we made up a third of it, roughly. Okay. What that tells us is we have a really great opportunity here. Because we have, we have the raw material for what's going to drive the future of this country. There's no question about it. And I, and I often say, you know, the oil and gas industry has been very good to Texas. It's going to be very good to Texas in the future. But all the oil wells that ever drilled, drilled and ever will be drilled are not as important to the future of Texas as these kids in these schools right now. 
I know a lot of you are honored today for your work in the school, and I, and I applaud you for that because it's it's uh, it's very very important. Here here's my concern. Okay, um, if you take the combination of the Hispanic school enrollment in Texas and the black enrollment in Texas, the Hispanics work very rapidly, blacks are very stable. If you take the two of those combined today, it's almost two thirds of our enrollment, and it's rising very quickly because the Hispanic population is younger, which is rising very quickly. And that's wonderful. It's diversity. It's great. It brings all kinds of great things to us. But the families that those kids come from have about 80%, less than 80% of the household wealth in the state of Texas. Okay? So think about that. Two-thirds of the kids, 80% of the money. What do you need some software? What do you need a tutor? What do you need a summer enrichment program? What do you need for broadband security? Those things are very tough. They're, they're very tough to come by. It makes it a real challenge to educate. There's also some other challenges. 20% of the, of the kids in our schools today are, uh, are, uh, uh, have a language barrier. 69% are economically disadvantaged. 80% of the growth in the last 10 years is in disadvantaged students. Think about that. 80% of the net growth. Because I mentioned in those other talks, I didn't mention Anglo's. We actually have 125,000 fewer Anglo kids than we had 10 years ago in the schools, but we have 55,000 more that are economically disadvantaged. So I mean, you begin to see the the, 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 the picture that, that we're painting here. And one, I do a lot of work in humanitarian efforts and that sort of thing. This one really grabs me sometimes. If you randomly walk into two classrooms in the state of Texas, on average, one kid is homeless. That's that's the reality today. And, our, and, and I'm going to give you a couple more numbers, and then I'll stop giving the numbers. What that says is we have a population that's absolutely more difficult to educate than the average. I mean, we know that. We're more challenging to educate than the average, and it's absolutely essential that we do. Yet we rank 41st in one measure, 43rd in the other, in pursuit of spending. And that's not saying money's up. It's the only answer. I mean, you, you need to spend it smartly and do the right things, but, but we need to really be focused on how to build up our, our schools in, in a great way. 71% of new jobs we'll create in the, next, in, the, in the next 15 years are going to require some type of certification or training. So, not necessarily a college degree or graduate degree or something, but at least something beyond the traditional high school diploma. Our, our adult literacy rate in Texas right now is 40%. So the folks who are already working can't do it, and we've got to make sure these kids can. And I mean, that's kind of what, what it looks like. The last couple of numbers I'll give you one the Census Bureau does. And Every two or three years, and it's a fascinating number to me. They don't look at particular places, but they look at how many people were born in a, in a state end up living in that state when they're adults. And how many people just kind of they grow up in a place, end up in that place. Texas leads the country in that. Probably not too surprising if you think about it. But it's 78 percent of the last number. So almost 435 kids we educate is going to be in our workforce. Yeah, we bring them in from other places and do all that kind of stuff. But the fundamental base of the workforce we have is going to be the workforce that we train. I'll give you one more number. This one comes from a highly reliable source, the Perryman Group. I'm telling you, those guys are good. I was messing with this in the last session, I think it was our session four, I was messing with this one day, and we, we, we did a simulation of our models, and we said, what if the quality of Texas education stays exactly the same as it is in the sense of the percentage of people we graduate from elementary school, junior high, high school, College, graduate school, professional school, the whole nine yards. We just stay where we are. We don't get better, we don't get worse. By ethnic group. And then we just let demographics take over and do what it's going to do. Because we're not, that, that's part of the equation we don't control. Okay? If that happens in 15 years, the average person, not family, the average person in Texas, take away all the inflation and all that stuff, will have 6000 up in today's dollars less income every year than they have today. What does that say about that great workforce that's to attract all these high tech industries? It's not going to be. What does that say about the social safety net we will have to have to support all those people? It is going to be here. So all of a sudden you find it's just a low growth, high need state. That's not a place we want to be. So I say that, as I say, it's, it's kind of to, to say that, that um, this is the greatest opportunity a state could possibly have. It swamps anything else to have these young people at a time when the single biggest demand we're going to have is workers. That's a great, you know, no state can have a better opportunity than that. We really, how we do it in the future states will depend on how we do. And that's
that area. Again, I thought you folks would get a little bit of that. I normally would close with a joke, and I know you guys like jokes, but since I've talked so long, I think I'll take a few questions and go, go ahead and take Okay, you can buy your book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and the collectives, no. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, recently, the news is that there was a microphone needed. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. better. No. Shall I just go ahead? Okay. I can you. I'll just give it back to the uh, Recently, there was an election in New York where the Amazon plant there, workers voted to unionize. Right. Which uh, may be good, maybe not good. Texas isn't a real unionized type state. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your feelings about how that might affect things as that continues to work forward? The question was, and I mostly heard about the unionization of the Amazon workers and how that's going to affect the economy, that sort of thing. Well, I think what you're going to see happening is, uh, and, and frankly, I don't think whether that people vote to join a union is going to be the determining factor here, but what we are seeing right now is the balance of power in negotiating. You want to play game theory or negotiate, but negotiation theory or whatever. The balance of power in negotiations between management and labor is going to move more in the direction of labor in the coming years because we're short. <laughs> you know, there's not too many other people. We don't have enough workers. And so the workers we do have are going to have more bargaining power. Now whether, I, I, again, I think a company like Amazon is probably more conducive to that than some of their other retail chains because of everything they do is not consumer facing directly with the people and that sort of thing. So I think they probably will probably it's higher percentage emphasis to do that sort of thing there. I think it's unlikely it's going to spread in a major way to Texas, as you said, Texas is not, not going to be a union state. But there's no question whether you're in a union or not, if you have a skill set that people need right now with the corporate shortage we have, you have some marketing power. And so I do think what you're going to see is wage rates are going to, as a percentage of the total how you carve up the pie, wages will move a bigger piece of that pie going forward. So we clearly are in a situation where there's a shortage of workers, and we'll replace some of the work with technology. I mean, we're already talking about drivers, <laughs> trucks, and all that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll do some of that, and then the warehouses will be more automated. But what people forget about that is technology changes jobs, but it, but it creates more jobs. The more technology we have, the more jobs we have. I mean, look at the world today. More people working than ever, and, and more technology than ever. When the wheel was invented 3,500 years ago, it displaced 75% of the workforce at that time. I guess all I did was put rocks on the back of all of us. I don't know. But, but it displaced 75% of the workforce. But think how many jobs the wheels created over, over history. I mean, I mean so, so the bottom line is, yes, well, I want to see technology. It changes the types of jobs, and that really puts pressure on retrain older workers. That's, I think that's a place our country would fail. But the bottom line is, with all that going on in regards with this shortage, the shift, there's going to be a balance of power shift to labor, and so labor will be with a big piece of pie. We don't have the means. Yes, sir. Great, great presentation, by the way. So just, I, I hear you saying that there's a great opportunity we have in the state of Texas uh, with all the workforce that is about to come in. How are businesses in North Texas how can they take advantage of this opportunity? What, what should they be doing? Question is, what, what can business be doing to take advantage of this opportunity? The first thing we can do is make sure the opportunity is here by encouraging your legislators and, 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 and everyone to support education in the state of Texas. We need we need. <laughs> You have, there's a great environment here. Our cost structure is good. You know, I mean, there are regulatory structures that is reasonable. Our tax structure could be better, but it's not bad compared to the rest of the country. We don't lose a lot of stuff because of our tax structure. We don't win a lot of stuff because of our tax structure. Uh, we have the best incentive programs in, in, in the country. We have a whole lot of these going for to grow here, and we've seen the results of that. I mean, they just gave out that governor's cup they give out every year. We just won it for the 10th year in a row. And that's for the most new corporate locations in the state. Not only did we win it, Ohio was second, we lapped them. We had like 1,100, they had like 500. I mean, I mean we, we, we doubled everybody else. And it, you know, it was, it, it, I mean, we have really, we're an economic journey out here. That's, that's good. That creates a lot of opportunities. But we are going to have to have a workforce to accommodate that. We are. How about real estate? Is this a great time, or what kind of time is this real estate? 
What kind of, kind of title is real estate? You know, it, it, it's somewhat depends on the type of real estate. Uh, we're in a very odd situation. A lot of people think we're going to have a housing collapse and all that, like we did in 2008. I don't think so, because we're not out building like crazy right now and, and giving mortgages that don't make sense and that sort of thing. So I don't think we're going to have that. I do think we're making in for what I would call a garden variety real estate correction here in the next few years because, uh, because the prices have really, really escalated. Most of that's because we can't get it built fast enough. So that's a different problem than when you have too much of it. It just keeps escalating. That's what we had in the 80s, that's what we had in 2008. This is a case of inventory has to catch up. And so what I think you're not going to see prices continue to grow at the, at the rate they have in the housing, but you are going to continue to see, uh, I think, some increases and some strength, but we still haven't caught up with the inventory yet. And so, I, I, again, I, yes, there will be a correction at some point. But uh, real estate's like engineers. Any, anything that takes a little while to produce always has its cycle. The economy is a whole mess, but they like engineers that way. There'll be a demand for engineers. So everybody tells their smart kids, go be an engineer. And so they all go make an engineer. And then a few years later, you blood. All those people tell the smart kids, but if you don't make an engineer. <laughs> and so then a few years later, it's short. And you go through that cycle. Real estate's about the same way. You can't produce it overnight. Uh, commercial real estate will be interesting. I think some of the big office buildings may well see part of their space converted to retail or, or urban living spaces and that sort of thing. I think there's going to be some reshaping of things. But by the same token, I don't think it's going to be like empty buildings forever because like people are going back to work. Uh, we had, <clears throat> you know, at the peak of this thing, we had 35% of people working from home. It's down to 12. It was six before the pandemic. So again, on any given day, fewer people are going to be in the office. But they may just want to go more square feet. Good, so they can have more elbow room and spread out a little bit if they need to. But, uh, but th so there will be some adjustments. But markets adjust to these things. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example of this, and I'll move on to another question if you have time. But back in Austin, in fact, a really bad bust in the 80s and all that, the big real estate flood and all that. There was a headline in Austin in 1990 in the states that said Austin has a 25 year supply of office space. We don't need to build anything else for the next 25 years. That was in 1990. I don't think any of you in Austin between 1990 and 2015, but they did build a building or two. <laughs> but I don't want to talk about that. But I want to go back to 1993, three years later. The National Association of Industrial Office Park did a survey around the country for our real estate and all that. What do you think the hottest real estate market in the country was three years after they said they had a 25 year flood? Austin, Texas was the hottest real estate market in the country. Which says we figured this stuff out. Again, markets work. You know, we, we, we repurpose some of it, we, we change some of it up, we do different things with it, but we, we figured this stuff out. And so, I, again, I think there'll be some, certain, some adjustments. I don't see a big, kind of big collapse or anything like that coming. We got a couple of your, uh, yes, sir. Yes, um, your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and their potential impact on the economy? Okay, my thoughts on cryptocurrencies and their potential impact on the economy. They're with us. They're, they're part of the landscape now. They're going to be here. And uh, and uh, basically, a lot depends on it. It's, you know, kind of what makes cryptocurrency work, maybe you don't know, is you have to fix the supply. If you don't fix the supply, you know, they have to mine for it, but there's only so much they can mine for. I mean, if they don't fix the supply, all the whole thing kind of really falls apart. But, um, but I mean, even the, you know, the U.S. is probably going to have a digital currency fairly soon. The banks are looking at it, the SEC is looking at it. It is part of our culture now. It's going to be with us. I don't think it replaces traditional currencies. And the reason is for something to be made, okay, it has to do three things. It has to be a medium exchange. You can buy and sell stuff with it. You can do that with cryptocurrency. It has to be a standard of value. You can have to be expressed prices in it. We're not doing that now, but we, we figure that out. We express prices in way of cryptocurrencies, but it also has to be, the third one has to be a store of value, of, of something you want to hold. How many of you would be willing today to buy a 30-year bond where the payment was based on the future of cryptocurrency? <laughs> I might make up for it. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's going to be a very important part of what we do. It's not going to replace the, the, the global monetary system, but it's going to be a bigger part of it. It's not going to replace it. Uh, well, I got one. I got three hands and one question. Oh, well, okay. I got three hands and three questions. You just said, okay. I'll do them fast. How quickly will the, the free market solve this gas increase? And, and are there really barriers to prevent the oil and gas companies from drilling to solve the problem? Uh, good question. How fast will the market solve this this, oil, this gas crisis and, and, and are there barriers? Uh, you know, it, I think we're going to see probably high prices for a few more months. A lot depends on how the Ukrainian situation plays out because that's going to affect. Russia's place in the market and that sort of thing. Uh, are there barriers? Yes, there are barriers. 
Uh, like everybody else, they have supply chain workforce issues. That's, that's one thing. They, they, they pay so much, they get around that pretty, pretty well at some point. But the, the barrier is right now, back uh, before the pandemic happened, it was like, you know, they drill, you know, they drill production of 20, 30 percent, they plant it all back in the drilling. They plant it all back in the drilling. So investors weren't making any money. And investors now wouldn't make money. And so, number one, they're going to drill at a slower pace, which is fine. It doesn't need to increase 20, 30 percent a year, you know, to get where it needs to be. But you've got to get the investment community convinced that they will, in fact, give them the money, that they will pay out more of the profits to investors and give them a decent rate of return. That they're having a real problem with the capital market now, particularly the mid sized companies. Big guys can get capital, but, but the smaller guys are going to have a problem with that. Those are the ones that usually lead the drilling activity. The new drilling programs are multi billion dollar investments, and they're not, they're not simple. That's a barrier. And then the other barrier is the political climate, quite frankly. I mean, people who think about it yourself, you have a billion dollars and you can do something with it, and you think, I don't think I can invest only gas. And you see something come out that says, we're going to get rid of this in 15 years. You might rethink that investment. And so, and, and again, I think that they, they have it wrong. And, and, and again, they, they have it wrong. Both sides have it wrong, but that's particularly wrong. And I think that that, uh, that also is impediment because people want to put their capital into something that's going to appreciate over time. And as long as that concern is out there about the policy environment, I think that's an impediment as well. I was wondering if yes or no, it's absolutely didn't work. Okay, I'm going to go over it. Yes, sir. Dr. Perriman, uh, you mentioned earlier that you know, we know we're, some of us have lived through the double digit inflation back here. Remember that? No, it's not as bad. Yet. But are you really that sanguine about where we're going on inflation? Because most of the economists, uh, Richard Fisher, the Hannadale area, they've been saying the Fed is behind the curve for eight or nine months now. Do you think they're that far behind the curve? Is the Fed behind the curve on inflation? Uh, the thing I'm going to say is, you know, obviously they're having to dance on the head of a pen here with that going on at the same time with Ukraine and things going on. You know, I, would I have liked to see them raise interest rates the first time three months earlier? Yes. Can they catch up with five or six rate increases this year if they need to? Yes. Okay, so, I mean, I, so you know, it, it's kind of one of those things that, that uh, uh, and I mean, precious, I'm an advisor to them, but I, that doesn't mean I can say what I think. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish they would have done it you know, three months earlier, but, but I think, yes, I think they can control it. And, and you have to remember, controlling inflation is in their wheelhouse. All this stuff they've been in the last few years is not. If you find the pandemics, you find the mortgage crisis, all that, that's not the Fed's historic role. You've got a lot of smart people in their years and years and years. They're back doing now what they cut their teeth on. And so I think, I, you know, I, I think some people underestimated their ability there. Uh, so I, yes, I, I mean, I, again, yes, I wish it a little bit sooner, but I think they're in a pretty good zone right now. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to compliment you. That's the shortest question he's ever asked. <laughs> <laughs> from the previous Bush administration. You look at Trump came in and flip-flopped everything back pretty dramatic, mm -hmm. dramatically. Then in comes this current administration and it's a flop on steroids. That is not what Americans have been used to for historically. We have movements, but they're more smooth, so to speak. They're, they're more moderated. These have been pretty dramatic. And so with everything, you mentioned, a bit, you made a very good case on, the, on the, uh, tr the COVID shutdown and its impact. We're still digging out of that with all these major flip-flops. And I'd like to know what your thoughts are going between now and, say, three years out. Wow, that went 30 seconds or less. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, yeah, the, the question was, with all the pretty dramatic policy shifts we've had as we went from Bush to Obama to Trump to, to, to Biden, all those you know, kind of dramatic trips and, and, and that sort of thing in policy and philosophy, uh, you know, which is a little, a, a, you know, pretty, pretty big flops. Uh, you know, is that, is that like, is that creating any difficulties for us? And, and I guess the short answer is certainly we'd like to have a little more stability, a little more predictability. Anytime you have uncertainty about the future, all of you business know that. If you have uncertainty, you're not going to take quite as much risk as you would otherwise. And so you're not going to have quite as much growth as you would otherwise. This, this applies to, uh, uh, to, to the change on, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of both parties. If you look back historically, though, this shift 
you know, competitive, competitive shooting say Eisenhower Kennedy or something. There have been other periods of time where we've had pretty big shifts in the, in, in, in the policy prescriptions uh, that we use in the way we went about doing things, and we've managed to adapt to them fairly well. This is a very, very adaptable economy. And, and that's one, it's, it's one of our real strengths. We always have to be very adaptive. We, we, we figure things out when we move forward. But yes, indeed, there's no question that the more uncertainty you create, the, you know, the, the, more, the, more, uh, the more you're going to sort of hold back economic growth. There's enough uncertainty out there without just trying to create itself. And, you know, I mean, and there's been a lot of things going on. I mean, the Obama administration, you know, as they came in, we were in the middle of the mortgage crisis. They did some pretty some crazy different things. So it's past health care reform the first year. The other thing that I wish we could do, and I'll close on this, because this is going to be close on it. I, the two parties have got to start talking to each other. <laughs> and, and everything you look at today, it didn't used to be that way. I mean, everything you look at, you know, whichever side had one or two more votes, they pass everything, because their side all goes for it, their side all goes against it. That's not how we've done things historically. If you look at the two periods of the greatest eras of revolution and legislation we've ever had, one Republican, one Democrat, were, were probably Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan. Lyndon Johnson got his done by working with Andrew Dirksen, a very conservative leader in the, in, of Republicans in, in the Senate. Okay? Ronald Reagan got his done by working with Tip O'Neill, a very liberal Speaker of the House. The one thing they had in common, both of them did it the same way. They played cards and drank scotch. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> but, uh, but, but we really do need to get to a point where, where we're focused on finding real solutions. And I can tell you, having done this for a long time and studied the century, that very rarely does either extreme have it right. It's you can, we need to get our best solutions from the clinic. When uh, uh, some smart people with some, with some good thoughts and good philosophy come together and duke it out and come to something in the middle. George Will, as once said, is something I think is very, very telling. He said, democracy is the politics of the half loaf. And I think democracy and economics and economic policy should be the economics of the half loaf. Nobody comes away with everything they want, everybody gets some of what they want, and we can come along pretty well with that. I'd like to see that happen. I'm still not planning for anything. Y'all did a great audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>
$500. It's for the kids. A thousand. A thousand. I mean, would it would it help if Dr. Perryman autographed it too? <laughs> I'll try anything. So a thousand back now. <laughs> okay. We're going the wrong direction. Anybody, we've got a thousand dollars for a football. That, that's equivalent to a half of the scholarship that we give away every year. So that, that's... Nick's a thousand, but he can keep the football. Right. Very good. So two thousand. Two thousand dollars. Anybody care to offer more? Otherwise, I'll, I'll close the bidding and, and, and accept two thousand dollars for the football. Thanks, Mayor Wee and Nick. <laughs> Lastly, we have a book from Dr. Perryman, and I'm told that we can get him to autograph this as well. Uh, but, and we also are gonna give away a subscription to his monthly, monthly newsletter, correct? And so, um, can, I get a, can I get a number on this book, autographed book from Dr. Perryman and a monthly subscription? 100. 500. 500. Five hundred dollars. Seven hundred. Anybody? Seven hundred dollars for a book, autograph. First edition. This is this is going to be worth a lot. Yes, yes. Um, I've got I've got five books I can ultimately give away. So I've got seven hundred. Seven hundred. Do I have three more at seven hundred? We'll give all of these books away. And, and and send a few kids uh, a scholarship here in the next couple of months. Anybody? 700. 700. Two more? We're Donna back in the back. One more. We're one mile away from home. Who's going to take us home? Anybody? I guess I could just start calling out names. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many banks in here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Plus, I had to follow Dr. Perryman. I mean, help me out here. I'm, you know, I'm trying to raise some money for some kids. So, anyway, uh, we'll do four at 700. I'll do the last one for 700. Five books. That's that's two scholarships that we just we just raised. And so, thank you very much. <laughs> Very good. Last but not least, I think I've thanked about everybody in the room, but if I haven't thanked you, thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. I think Dr. Perryman was, was fantastic. He's always a great speaker, very entertaining. So very <laughs> his information and his delivery is very impactful, and I think we all left here with something uh, we can use today. Uh, we do have um, the flower arrangements on your table. Uh, John's asked, whoever's birthday is closest to April 1st gets the bouquet. So uh, please take those with you. And I do want to say thank you to Pam Hudson, who prepared the centerpieces. So I see I lost the room already. Okay. But it's not going to take me much to get off the stage. Yes, if, 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 if you uh, want an auction item, please meet us up here. Or we're going to take the money before you leave. <laughs> Thank you all. Go ahead and pray Friday.